Hello, people of grace, and welcome to worship with us today on November 22nd, 2020. Today is Reign of Christ Sunday. It's a more recent uh, church holiday uh, developed just about a century ago as a means of combating the rising waves of fascism, uh, especially in Europe at the time of the holiday's creation. It's a day to remember that Jesus is our authority, that we find our strength and our power not in human authorities, not in human powers, but in Jesus Christ and the love of God. It's the final Sunday in the church liturgical year. We begin a new year uh, next Sunday with the first Sunday in Advent. I know it's Advent already. We're already only five weeks away from Christmas. But next week, the pyramids will be blue and we'll be getting in the spirit of preparing for Christmas and the arrival uh, of God on earth with Christ's birth. I also just want to use this welcome time, Grace, to say that it's been such a joy to be here and be your intern. I know that this is a thoroughly, thoroughly weird internship here. Uh, and it's been hard to not get to, well, know you all as well as we would if we were worshiping in the sanctuary space every Sunday. But I also want to assure you that I can feel your love and your support um, through the camera lens, on the Facebook page, on the YouTube page, whatever, you know, wherever you are watching this worship, um, I can feel your love and support and it means the world to me. It's been nothing short of encouraging and life-giving and I am so grateful to be here and I'm so grateful to be a part of this congregation and serving this congregation. So thank you for joining us for worship today and I now ask that you prepare your hearts and minds as we begin our reign of Christ's worship with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. We turn to hymn number 434 in the ELW, Jesus Shall Reign, number 434.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God of power and might, your Son shows us the way of service, and in him we inherit the riches of your grace. Give us the wisdom to know what is right and the strength to serve the world you have made through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from Ezekiel. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep, and I will seek them out as shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep. So I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the watercourses and in all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down on good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, but the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them with justice. Therefore, says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep. Because you pushed back with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide, I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to the Lord with psalms. For you, Lord, are great God above, a great ruler above all gods. In your hand are the caverns of the earth, the heights of the hills are also yours. The sea is yours, for you made it with your hands, have molded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For the Lord is our God. We are the people of God's and the sheep of God's hand. Oh, that day you would hear God's voice. This is a reading from Ephesians, the first chapter. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? And what is the amazing greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The wisdom of the Lord, thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as the shepherd shep separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And, and when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? The king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they will also answer, Lord, 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 when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Today we're going to begin in 14th century England. I know, I know, bear with me. You see, some of the earliest liturgical dramas that we know about come from a small city of, uh, called York in England that would put on a cycle of plays about stories in the Bible, and each play was sponsored by a different group of merchants or artisans who got to make certain decisions about how the parable would be portrayed by the actors. And this parable, The Last Judgment, was the final in that cycle, even after Jesus' resurrection. And it was, um, it was produced by the tailors. And their costumes, of course, were the key, because the tailors would prepare the costumes for the characters. And the characters playing the sheep were dressed in the finest linens, clothed in fantastic, colorful tunics and dresses, specially designed by the tailors, so that when Jesus commended the sheep for sharing food, water, and clothing to those in need, the play emphasized the message that the good guys were the people who could afford clothing, food, and water to give away. Meanwhile, the actors playing goats were dressed in roughshod and dirty clothing, so that when Jesus reprimanded them for not giving food, water, or clothes to no those in need, the play told the message that God condemned anyone who could not afford the clothes sold by the tailors. That's terrible, right? It's an utter distortion of this parable. But I bring up this old drama because it's influenced our understanding of Jesus' words for centuries. We inherit a reading of this text corrupted by power dynamics that separate people into the roles of the helpers and the helped and tell us that to earn Jesus' favor, we should be the helpers and should never need help ourselves. Completely missing the point that in this parable, Jesus calls us into a world without borders, without barriers, without power dynamics and hierarchies, because in this parable, Jesus radically identifies with all of us, calling us to be both servant and served. Because Jesus gives us this parable not as a warning to make sure that we are on the right side, but to illustrate that the reign of God begins when we recognize the divinity and worth of every human being and their worthiness of receiving love, care, and justice. In Jesus' description of the Last Judgment, the only separation between sheep and goats is their willingness to care for the needs of the people they encountered in their lives. They're not separated by their race, their sexuality, their gender, their political affiliation, their economic status, not even their faith, just their willingness to recognize that they owe their fellow human beings unconditional love, care, and support. And the sheep are astounded to learn that this care is something special. So Jesus explains, that when they fed someone who was hungry, gave drink to the thirsty, clothed someone who was naked, visited people in prison or who were sick, when they acted towards other human beings with compassionate, self-giving love, they were doing that, in fact, for Jesus. Because Jesus identifies with anyone and everyone who has ever been in need of care. And the people that Jesus calls blessed are the people who loved others as if they were Jesus. So here is the good news for this week, I know, already. Have you ever been in need? Then Christ lives in you. And you have, have you ever helped someone in need? Then you have seen Christ and been Christ to another. Does that seem like too low of a requirement? Perhaps, but that's the point. Jesus tells us that the goal of Christianity is not to appease God with enough right actions, but to recognize that Jesus Christ lives in everyone who has ever needed someone or something from someone else. That includes you. That includes everyone. And it should change the way that we live. Yet it is so difficult, it is so difficult for us to hear such an egalitarian message because our world does not reward us for loving everyone. 
in fact, quite the opposite, like the tailors producing the play about this passage centuries ago, the powers of this world, and that includes the church, have traditionally told us that we need to pick and choose where we see Jesus in the world. We are encouraged in this world to create barriers between us and them and to draw limitations around who Jesus gets to identify with, usually claiming that Jesus is sympathetic towards us but would never identify with them. We do this. We all do this. I do this every day whenever we decide that someone is unworthy of our help, our care, our love, our time. And this is the mistake that the goats make when they assume that Jesus could never truly identify with people who aren't like them. They're glad to help people who look like them, but cannot understand why Jesus would like, identify with the least of these. And so they pick and choose who they help. Or maybe they help from a distance, but never change the way they treat people different from them. Or maybe they would help people, but they would never seek justice that could eliminate the cause of the need in the first place. In each case, refusing to see the love of Jesus Christ in the needs of their neighbors. But the problem for the goats, and for a lot of us, is that it is near impossible to acknowledge that you carry Jesus Christ within you without acknowledging that the same is true for everybody else. Try telling yourself right now that you are Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ lives in you, that Jesus Christ loves you so much, that Jesus lives in you, that because you have needed someone, Jesus lives in you. If that's hard to say, or even scary to say, it's because powers of this world tell us that we need to earn the right to say that Jesus lives within us. Because if we believe that we all carry the love of Jesus within us, that we all carry infinite worth, then this world would change dramatically. So instead, powers in this world tell us that we need to be strong, that we should limit Jesus' love, and just make sure that we only help people that are in our group. And so it becomes hard for us to hear that Jesus could ever truly identify with us because we are taught to believe that Jesus could not be in everyone around us. Otherwise, we would have to admit that we treat Jesus pretty terribly. But Jesus is aware of the obstacle of power that tells us that we are unworthy. And so Jesus chooses to dismantle all oppressive barriers and separations with a simple, radical statement. That which you did for the least of these, you did to me. In a single statement, Jesus identifies with every human being who has ever needed anything, especially the weakest and the most marginalized and the most need of help, so that we all may know that we are all connected, not through our power, but through our mutual need and our mutual worthiness of having those needs met. Because just as nothing can separate us from the love of, love of God, so also nothing can truly separate us from finding a way to love one another once we recognize that Jesus lives in all of us, connecting all of us. And if this is starting to seem wildly idealistic, remember that this isn't just Christianity saying this. Science, actually, of all things, says the exact same thing. There's a beautiful music video composed by John D. Boswell that collects a series of secular scientists describing how their research shows that we are all connected. I've included a link in the Facebook uh, and YouTube descriptions for this service. I encourage you to watch it. It's a fun song. In, in this song, scientists like Bill Nye, Carl Sagan, and Neil deGrasse Tyson demonstrate that we are all connected through our composition as a collection of atoms, through our shared dependence upon nature, through our capacity to imagine, dream, think, and feel. All to make the case that how we treat one person is how we treat every person 
and the entire universe. And on this Reign of Christ Sunday, our text reveals the same. The text does not assert that Jesus' reign is the reign of a king who is in control of absolutely everything and who does things for their own glory. Rather, this text reveals that we are the reign of Christ, that Jesus chooses to live in us, that we are the reign of Christ through the actions that we take to care for one another and seek justice for one another, that when we realize that Jesus Christ has freed us so that we may be free to treat one another like we are all connected, well, that is where the reign of Christ begins in us. And of course, recognizing and living with the truth that we are all connected through Jesus Christ means that we are indeed called to radically reshape the way we live in the world. Recognizing that Christ lives in our body and and lives in the body of every person we meet calls us to treat each other with a near overwhelming love and respect. It means that we must dismantle systems of oppression by proclaiming that we live in the reign of Christ, which means that all people are worthy of every love, justice, and respect. It means that we are to care for the immediate needs of the people around us and seek justice that creates a more equitable world. It means that we have a lot of work to do. So before this becomes too overwhelming, I want you to consider this this quick thought exercise. What if we took all the hymns that we're singing in worship today and replaced the name Jesus with the least of these? Jesus shall reign becomes the least of these shall reign. Soon and very soon, our hymn of the day, soon and very soon we are going to care for the least of these. And crown him with many crowns can become crown the least of these with many crowns. These new titles do sound a bit cheesy, but what if we started by considering how we can make those statements true? How we can we begin crowning Jesus with many crowns by lifting people out of poverty? How can we begin making Jesus' reign a reality by lifting up the marginalized into leadership in our community, country, even church? How can we be sure that soon and very soon we will begin seeing people who are different from us as Jesus Christ in our world? And then, remember that from today's parable, you also can replace Jesus' name with your own. You shall reign. Soon and very soon, we are going to take care of your needs. You, too, deserve to be crowned with many crowns. Because Jesus' reign is the reshaping of the world to be one where everyone's needs are cared for by everyone else, because we all deserve to be cared for, because God has deemed us worthy of love, worthy of identifying with, and living within. In this parable of the Last Judgment, which is really more of a declaration, Jesus declares that the world God's intent, or that the world God intends is a world without barriers and walls where all who need love and care receive love and care, and all who can offer love and care freely give it. And at the end of a sermon that I wear, or where I worry that I might seem like I'm asking too much, I want to highlight what a fantastic job Grace Lutheran Church has done to care for the needs of our community this year. The Fox Trust Committee chose to tithe from its fund, sending an enormous amount of money to support people in crisis. The social ministry team has helped local organizations stay afoot amidst a pandemic. We've begun a food pantry that is a daily source of life for people. The prayer shell team has sustained our community with hope. The youth and faith formation ministry have begun forums to expand our conception of racial and gender justice. That's only the things that I've seen since I've been here for three months. I know that there are more. And perhaps most significantly, 
We've all helped one another keep going during a global pandemic. All throughout this church, I see people caring for their neighbors in need. But this year has also revealed how much we still need to do. A full year of divisive politics has revealed how much more often we draw lines than work to recognize Jesus living in our neighbor's needs. The murder of far too many people of color in our country this past year reminds us that we need to repent for the sins of racism, learn the ways that racism corrupts us and limits us, so that we can grow to better extend and share love and care to our siblings of color across the world. And this pandemic has revealed our need for a society that cares for all of its people and seeks justice for those who are disproportionately oppressed for their race, class, ability, gender, or sexuality. We've got a lot of work left to do to fulfill Christ's promise that we are all connected by our needs and called to care for one another in our needs. But we begin by remembering the beautiful promise of this passage. Jesus lives in your need. Jesus lives in the need of every human being. We are not sheep or goats. We are people who carry Jesus Christ within our bodies, who are capable of being Jesus Christ to others by caring for one another's needs, capable of creating the reign of God the minute that we begin treating everyone, literally everyone, as a wonderful, unique, and essential part of God's creation, worthy of our care, justice, and our love. Amen. We will now sing our hymn of the day, ELW number 439. Soon and very soon. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us confess our faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Longing for Christ's reign to come among us, we pray for the outpouring of God's power on the church, the world, and all in need. Sovereign of all, train our ears to hear your cry in the needs of those around us. Bless all social ministries of the church through which we seek to serve others as we ourselves have been served. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You cause rain to fall on the just and unjust alike. Direct our use of creation to provide for the needs of all people in ways that are sustainable for the earth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Bring peace to every place where conflict rages. Grant opportunities for ending divisions among us and usher in your reign of unity and reconciliation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Heal the sinful divisions we erect between us and release us from systems of oppression and prejudice. Restore our capacity to see your image in those whose dignity we have stripped away. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Pour out the gifts of your spirit on children and youth throughout the church. Sustain those who work in children's ministry, youth ministry, and campus ministry as they nurture the gifts of young people. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We thank you for the saints now departed who fed the hungry, clothed the naked, and tended to the sick. Inspire us by their example that we may see your presence in those in need around us. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Receive our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Until that day when you gather all creation around your throne, where you will reign forever and ever. Amen. And now the peace of Christ be with you all and also with you. Please take this time to share Christ's peace with one another and with those around you. I will say one of my favorite moments being at Grace thus far is the, the delight and awkwardness of um, being on the Zoom worship when everyone unmutes themselves and shares a bit of peace and it's kind of a crisscross menagerie of sound. I'm not saying that you have to be on Zoom, of course, to worship, but consider really sharing a sign of peace with someone. Maybe that means a call this week or something just to let people know that you are thinking about them and blessing them with Christ's peace. A few announcements that we have today. Um, remember that our Advent kits are being distributed this afternoon. Um, and so if you forgot to send a notification that you might want one, this is your last chance this time. You should send a message to me at intern at glcwhen.org. Uh, 
uh, send it to me immediately, and maybe we might have some extra supplies to throw something together. We can for sure get you the Advent devotions, so those will also be um, posted online as well. I also want to lift up that we are, this is a preliminary announcement, so I can't give too many deals, details quite yet, but we're also putting together uh, some gift boxes uh, to be distributed for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. They'll include a kind of interactive service for Christmas Day that you can do with your family and those around you since we will not be able to gather in person. And of course, we'll have plenty of weeks before that happens, but if you'd like to, if you'd be interested in receiving one of those gift boxes from Grace, by all means, let me know, same email address, as soon as you can or would like. And then one more announcement, Pastor James is beginning to set up a book discussion group. Uh, you can email him at pastor at glcwen.org if you would be interested in uh, joining this book discussion group. Uh, the book is on inviting congregations, um, which is how to become an inviting congregation, not inviting other congregations to things. And now with that, I will ask you to take a few moments of silence in preparation for our offering prayer and then um, entering into our sacrament of Holy Communion. Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. O Son, O Son, O Son, which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and then he gave it for them all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. 
Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please receive the blessing. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine on you with grace and mercy. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We will now sing our sending hymn, ELW 855, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
People of grace, now go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. Thank you.